Welcome to FACT's webinar called Best Practices for Pastured Poultry Health, Production, and Profit, presented by Mike Badger with the American Pastured Poultry, Poultry Producers Association. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACTS. I am Larissa McKenna, FACTS Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar this evening. Thank you all for joining us. It is certainly a pleasure to have you here. So just a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT is a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Chicago and we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk and eggs. It's a picture of me so you can put a, a name to a face. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. For example, we are currently accepting our applications for our Fund to Farmer grants. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the grants at the end of the webinar. In fact, also facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So please visit our website, which I have um, listed, to learn more about our farmer services and to apply for a grant or to register for a future webinar. But this time, I'm honored to introduce our esteemed presenter, Mike Badger. Mike is the director of the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association, or APPPA for short. Um, along with his family, he operates Badger's Millside Farm in Pennsylvania. And I'm honored that Mike is with us tonight to share some of his recommendations for successfully raising uh, poultry and pasture. He will be available to answer your questions later on in the webinar. Uh, so at this point, I am going to hand the virtual mic over to uh, virtual mic over to Mike so that he may start his presentation. Uh, with that, Mike, please take it away. Hey, good evening, Larissa and Gurley. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, thank you for for allowing me to come on today and tonight and talk about pasture poultry uh it's one of the things i find myself doing quite often obviously and you know as we jump in and get started here you know we're going to talk a little bit about um suggested practices for pasture poultry health production and profit because one of the things that we do at appa is we really focus on the pasture poultry as a business model and i, I realize some folks may be primarily raising pastured poultry to feed their families. But the the ideas and the, the things that I talk about tonight will kind of be applicable to everybody a, across the, the spectrum. You know, and a little bit about me, you know, you, you've heard the, the, the big items there. I do work with the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association. Uh, we just call it APA is how we pronounce that acronym. It's a whole lot easier to say. And I have a, a pasture poultry talk podcast and, you know, I do do some of my own pasture poultry at, you know, on my farm. Uh, but primarily these days, my emphasis is, is APA. That's the driving, you know, force of my time. And so what are we going to talk about here? And what are these pasture poultry best practices? I got to be honest with you. When I, when I hear the word best practices, I kind of cringe a little bit. Um, but really what we're we're talking about here is kind of the the foundational items of of what it takes to to successfully raise pastured poultry you know one of the analogies that i always like to to bring about and use is a sports team you know when you have a football team since it is football season and they're a team is performing poorly they're losing oftentimes you hear the coach say we need to get back to basics you know we need to we need to tackle we need to pay attention. We need to practice hard. Those, those basics. And when I think about the best practices, that's kind of what I'm thinking about here is just getting back to those, those basic keystone ideas that leverage natural poultry behaviors. Um, they, they don't tie you into doing stuff that, that blocks your creativity. So these are just things that will get you a, a healthy, profitable, poultry, you know, chicken, broiler, turkey, egg, you know, whatever the case may be. And the items I'm going to pull out here tonight to share with you are really just kind of experiences, right? They're, a lot of it's distilled from the APA community of producers, um, personal experience, a lot of, a lot of time talking with, with, you know, other experts, you know, and, and I always try to find myself in the room with the smartest people that I can, you know, the people that are smarter than me. And I think that's that's pretty important when you're 
when you're trying to to get good or learn about something is you always seek out the people who know more than you and you you tag on to them and and you know engage with them and 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 have that conversation and that's really that's really one of the the awesome parts of of appa is that community aspect um so as we go through tonight just know i want to leave a lot of time on the back end for questions um you know we I do spend a lot of time answering questions. You know, I may not have all of those answers when the question time comes, but uh, I'm accessible and we can continue the conversation later. But we're gonna we're gonna move through these items so that we we leave a lot of time for that Q and A, and you'll have the reference material here in the webinar replay. Okay, Larissa, if you would like to play our our video. We're going to watch a, a short clip here. It's about 30 seconds. Uh, it, this is a trailer for an upcoming video project that we have. And you guys are kind of seeing this for the first time. It hasn't been out yet. And uh, so we're just, we'll watch it and then we'll talk about it. And we'll use that to, to launch into our presentation. Pastured poultry is is chickens were raised in as natural environment as you can and for us that means putting them out here right here on the pasture with daily moves so they have constant access to fresh pasture bugs grass scratching in the dirt doing things that make a chicken a chicken other people they portray themselves as us we don't do a good job of marketing who we are and the ones that don't do what we do do a good job of marketing that they do it like us Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Um, so uh, I apologize for the, the pixelation on the video. It, we couldn't solve that problem. It will be clear on the replay and this will be out there for public consumption here in the next day or so. And then our full feature film coming soon. So those characters you saw on the screen, the first one was David Hale. The second one was Terrell Spencer, uh, both APA board members and, uh, pastured poultry producers. So this is obviously setting up a, a, a video, a, a message to consumers about what makes pastured poultry different than all those other things. And that really, from a producer standpoint, that difference starts with a lot of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So, you know, as we think about this, what is pastured poultry, right? We have to, we have to hang our hat here. Unfortunately, you know, there's so many confusing pieces in the in the chicken landscape nowadays that we have to actually be very intentional in a in how we define pastured poultry when we talk to it to other farmers and other consumers and you you heard it there in that short intro pastured poultry is movement it's continuously moving to fresh fresh pasture you know this is the foundation that gives you the healthy chicken that lets you raise it without antibiotics with with you know, but builds the soil health without damaging the pasture. You know, it's seasonally appropriate. Broilers, you know, in the in the north, you know, they have a season. They shut down in the this in the winter, in the late fall, and the hens come inside. Uh, in in the south, you know, in places like Florida, the the off season for broilers might be July and August. So there's seasonality to it, and we have to think that it's different than some of the other labels that we find you know interestingly enough today i had a, a phone call from a conventional chicken grower who has eight barns on his farms and he's they're too old he can't get more contracts until he upgrades and that's about a two million dollar note so he's trying to figure out how he can gr get on this organic free range bandwagon and uh, you know clearly would be difficult to set up a pastured operation with with that infrastructure but one of the things that he said really struck me was that he just needs to make money and his 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 hemp his reason for seeking out me and the organic and whatever else you might think was to make money and that's kind of a that's, that's not really the the driving force of our of our membership and of our community right now there's an ideal here and it it builds on this idea that there's a better way to raise poultry. 
And we know we we won't belabor the organic point. Just know that organic means something. But a lot of times that chicken is raised in nearly identical conditions to the conventional poultry. They just swap out some feed. And free range doesn't mean birds are outside. They just means that they had some doors to the outside. So I always like to say that we expect pasture poultry to live outside. That is the expectation. There is no assumption. It's out there as the season is appropriate. And pasture poultry is always cage-free. Every single day of the year, pasture poultry eggs are always from cage-free hens. Um, and so this is obviously that's a little bit of a some some marketing as we get get going, but that's that's how we should be thinking about this. When you look at all these terms floating around there, we got to figure out why we're different and be able to articulate it. And that's part of what we're this video that we just watched in the larger version will be driving at. We'll be promoting that difference in a very upbeat and positive way. So now we come back down to to kind of the um, the nuts and bolts here. The the, the things where most of our producers really excel at is, is, is the production side and this idea of how do you raise a bird so that it's healthy, happy, and, and profitable and nutritious, right? Um, and one, one of those things begets the other. A, a healthy bird is going to naturally be a pleasant eating experience and nutritious and it's going to be profitable because it's going to perform to your expectations. So all these things are interrelated. And if you're just raising a few birds for yourself, then being able to raise a healthy bird that meets expectations is also important. You, just because you don't sell birds doesn't mean that you want to you know, do it in, in an inefficient way. So we're going to start in the brooder. We're going to work through some of these core ideas and talk really about some of the things that are intentionally different about raising pasture poultry or, or some of the things that our producers do that actually have some some influence in our final product. So, you know, I know we're in, we're in fall here. I'm in Pennsylvania. We're heading into fall, which we'll probably just skip and go straight to winter. Um, but as I think to the spring, you know, people are closing down their, their, their brooders. Now their, their broilers are coming out the last batch, but in the spring, you know, in my neck of the woods, March is usually when people bring in their first batch of meat birds to the brooder. And I used to do a lot of on-farm processing. I had a mobile unit and I had a customer that I went to every week. And when you bring birds in, in the beginning of March, in my neck of the woods, you're playing with, with the weather. It's going to either be cold, hot, or just right. And it's very infrequently just right. Um, it's a volatile time of year. So I had a customer who it was cold and sustained cold, but he had birds in the brooder. So he buttoned up the brooder, just took the whole thing, closed it all up, made it airtight, you know, perfect. Well, guess what? His birds started dying. They didn't gain weight. They looked sickly, you know, and, and his his uh, solution was to treat them with some kind of antibiotic, you know, rather than seek out help from people who could have helped him, you know, he, he went a different route, but his, his problem was caused by, you know, bad brooder management and brooder management really sets the tone for the rest of your bird's life. You know, if you, if you mess up the brooder, the, all your rest of your grow out will be, will be bad as well. And, so speaking there to the point of ventilation, you always want to have ventilation in your in your brooder in every single weather condition, which is what I'm trying to illustrate with when I talk about that that producer. Um, you know, because you need to exchange that air inside the the brooder, and and if you walk in there and it's stuffy and you know you can feel the air, that's that's really really bad. You don't like it. Your birds don't like it. Um, and th that's the idea of ammonia, right? Because you'll really also start to, to build up ammonia. And ammonia is a really tricky thing. Many of us think that we can smell ammonia problems. And by the time you smell it, it's almost always over the limit. You know, we, we don't smell ammonia till the, it's about 25 parts per million. You know, if you were to test the, the air quality there with, for ammonia, and it causes damage and respiratory damage at about 10 parts per million. So, you know, that's, that's a big gap. And 
and a ventilation will help with that. So we'll keep in your brooder clean, dry, and warm. You know, when we see things in the brooder, like in, you know, that seven day, 14 day time frame of coccidiosis, you know, necrotic enteritis, those things, they're hundred percent preventable by keeping a dry, clean brooder. Um, and if you have, if you have, um, pot, you know, wet spot in your, by your waterers or some, any kind of caked spot in your brooder, you need to get it out every day. You know, if you have a, has a hard time keeping wet, you know, or I'm sorry, having a hard time keeping it dry and keeping water off of it or cake spots, you gotta, you gotta put in the extra effort to get that stuff out of there, you know, remove the wet, add the dry, and you'll be rewarded with, with healthier birds. And this period in the brooder, if you have those cool nights and you have the, where your heat is maybe uh, not not so well and doesn't function right they can get stressed out get a con you know condition called ascites and that doesn't usually show up and start killing your birds until like week five and six and seven and all the way into processing but that's that usually happened inside the brooder and you usually see it because the birds are purple in extreme cases and the cavities the abdomen cavities fills up with uh, fluid and eventually it, it kills the birds. So brooder management there is very, very critical. And because we, one of the challenges pastured folks have in a brooder environment is we tend to use a lot of passive ventilation. You know, we don't have a, a, a big fancy barn with automated air ventilation systems to keep everything just right. You know, we're relying on basically passive ventilation which sometimes doesn't work sometimes it works but that's why you know keeping maintaining a very comfortable stocking density paying attention to your your bedding uh, is is pretty important and in terms of stocking density you know lay it out here in the brooder you know you're for broilers like the Cornish cross freedom rangers if if you plan on having you know, about one square foot per bird when they're three weeks old, which is about the time they are going to go out the pasture. Uh, you're, you're, you're good. And people certainly do it with less than that, but the comfortable proven metric is one. Um, layers, you know, that one square foot at about seven, six weeks old, maybe eight turkeys, one and a half square foot at four weeks. So, Sounds like a lot, but when you put these birds out on pasture, they're going to be getting similar spaces. And that's part of how you keep them healthy. And because the brooder is so important, we'll spend just a few more minutes here. There's a, there's a popular idea out there that we brood turkeys and broiler chickens together because the Cornish cross geniuses will teach the, the dummy turkeys how to live. Okay. And that, that idea was popularized by, of course, Joel Salatin in his book. And it's still in, in play in a lot of farms today. But the reality is, even Joel has moved away from that model and broods turkeys separately in a cleaned out brooder and reports having a lot of different, a lot better success with turkey mortality coming out of the brooder. So turkeys get this rap as one of those things that you... Are, you know, they just look for ways to die, but sometimes they just need a little more attention. They need you, the farmer, to be in their brooder with them throughout the day, interacting with them, you know, getting them interested in the water and the feed. And if you keep them separate, I think you'll have a little bit better success brooding those turkeys than if you're co-mingling them with your, your chickens. And again, exceptions definitely apply, but this is some of the ways that work very well. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if we move our next phase, then we go from brooder to pasture management. Then some of the, the critical things we need to think about here is predation. Um, you know, it really, it really kind of gets under my skin when I take a phone call from somebody or talk to somebody who is raising birds outside on pasture and they 
they have a predation problem. And we all have those problems. But when I ask, well, what are you doing to, to prevent those predators from getting into your birds? And they're like, well, I let the birds run around, <laughs> you know, meaning there is no protection. So we as shepherds of our flock need to take the time and account for predation control. And there's a couple ways to do that. You know, one one way is shelter design, simple daily move shelters. Like if you got meat birds, putting them in a in a shelter, whether it's a hoop house or a one of the Salatin style shelters, but be, ha, confining them to a to their shelter, giving them lots of space, and moving them every day to new pasture, then that's a that's a really awesome <laughs> predator deter- deterrent. Um, simple portable electric fencing or if you have the permanent fencing in place but perimeter fencing around your where you're grazing those birds is also a a good way to deter ground predators um you know through the night you know the raccoons the foxes and things like that and of course when it comes to animals livestock guardian dogs are usually the go-to predator defense for a lot of people in the pasture poultry community. I don't have a lot of experience with the dogs. Um, I, I have run geese before and it was very, very, they did very well in protecting my laying flock. Um, I used to have some predation from great horned owls and the, the loud, the loudness, the alertness of the geese seemed to have done the trick to, to make a lot of noise and deter those predators and their big bodies running around the, the egg mobile. So always you need to account for, for predators. It's, it's, it's a fact of what we do, but you know, you, you, you can't not, you can't overlook the predation and expect to have any kind of long-term success. It just doesn't happen. Cause that's one of the things that will quite literally kill you and your flock. Um, you know, the, other things for pasture, you want to avoid that that static run environment where you know the birds are continuously grazing in an area, and you know that this is this is kind of the dirt lot poultry, right? You know, no no pasture poultry comes from a dirt lot, and it's really that's one of the the in unsanitary environments that we run into is where those birds are constantly manuring and maybe even eating feed off of the same dirty pooped up environment. You know, just not, it's not a good foundation for health. The health comes from the fresh pasture, you know, moving those birds away from their own manure. Uh, Whether you do that in a daily move or whether you do that, you know, inside a, a paddock that's shifted with your egg mobile. So coming back to that idea of, of the shelters, you know, one of the, one of the ideas here is you, we already talked about the predator protection, your pasture shelter should be able to be moved. Um, another requirement that you would want to consider here when you build a pasture shelter is, is it protective from the weather? So what, in, in, in a lot of times that, that simply means it's going to keep rain off of the flock. It's going to keep the wind out of the flock. So you have to account for drafts. It's going to create shade because your broilers, your meat birds don't like the, the, the burning sun. Your layers aren't going to really be all that thrilled with, with the midday sun either. You know, they like shade. Um, turkeys, you know, they're, they're pretty flexible. They roll with it. But so you want, you want that, I, you want that shade and to be into your, designed into your shelter too. And that just, sometimes that means when you build your shelter, your hoop house or your, whatever it is, you know, being cautious not to use greenhouse plastic, you know, even in the winter, when you bring the birds in using, if you use like a greenhouse plastic that lets intense light through, you know, that they're not going to react well to that intense light, especially if it snows and the, the light shines off of that. It's going to drive those hens crazy in the winter um, and they're going to go crazy by pecking each other and potentially stop laying. But, you know, those 
So those simple things, you know, when, when you're building this, your shelter and putting birds out on pasture is just making, making it comfortable. You know, I always, always used to go out in my early years of raising, go out into my pasture in the driving rain and stand in it. So I would put a raincoat on, walk out there, stand in my hoop house and say, okay, am I getting wet? What are my birds doing? Are they staying dry? So I would knew how the, they reacted in, in the weather elements because they didn't have a chance to come inside the house. They, they, their house, you know, it either worked or it didn't. And if it didn't, you know, usually that's a recipe for, for, for piling and, and other, you know, stressful environments that could lead to, to health problems. excuse me and uh so this idea when we talk about our um our pasture housing we need to kind of one of the common questions usually comes and and comes up is is densities how much how many birds do i put and you know where and how often do i move them and that's a that's a kind of a, an involved question. It's really also kind of situational. So we can talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some generalities and these are places to start. So when you're, when you're looking at pasture housing, you know, let's, let's start with the meat birds. You know, these are the broilers and you know, generally going to start somewhere, assuming we're processing a, that bird at, you know, about six pounds live weight, which is seven weeks, maybe, um, you know, maybe eight weeks, get a little bit bigger, but you're going to look at one and a half to two square feet of space per chicken when it reaches that seven, eight week mark. And, and that gives them the space they need to, to, you know, forage, stay clean during the day while you move them. Um, and, you know, if it's hot, like the hot of heat of the summer, you might want to go closer to that two square feet to give them more ventilation and more airflow in the in the uh, in the house. So, you know, this is this is again, this is a little bit of situational being able to observe your flock and seeing what's happening, and and make some adjustments to it. A lot of times, people will process at seven weeks or eight weeks. So at seven weeks, they may be running like one and a half square feet. And then it, they pull half of that flock out and then it, you know, they, it gets a little bit more comfortable in there for the birds as they go into that extra week or so of, of growth. So <clears throat> then if you think about, and, and generally speaking, moving bird, moving meat birds daily in that kind of environment is really kind of, we recommend it. That's, that's a lot of, you know, that is the original model. People day range meat birds, but you know, and, and some, some be breeds will do better than at that than others. Corners cross, they tend to, they, they tend to favor and do very, very well in that daily move shelter. And it's, it actually helps, you know, build the soil health and, and fertility very quickly in that, in that kind of a setup too. So, because every day you're getting a concentrated shot of manure in a different section of pasture. So, laying hens are, are a little bit different story. Most people still put them in some kind of a range setup, um, whether that's in a portable fencing that gets that where the paddock gets shifted every five seven days, or you know some there's there's people out there running egg mobiles where they will they basically are in a in a, in a real honest free range environment where the, the egg mobile was moved like a hundred feet every day. And they just go through the pasture like that. Um, but there's, and there's some kind of bigger perimeter fence, but there isn't necessarily a paddock defined. Um, so that's very, that's very doable, you know, and, and, and housing density inside that egg mobile in, in that kind of range setup, you know, I've seen it go from anywhere from like point to a third of a foot square foot to all the way up to people do one square foot here. And part of this will depend on your breed, heavier breeds need a little bit more space, but basically you want everybody to be able to roost 
inside of that eggmobile at one time and be be in out of the weather and under under protection at simultaneously and and you need to have nest boxes in there so you know those are those are the considerations really for your your pastured egg egg uh, housing is they need to roost be protected from the weather and have a place to lay their eggs and if you got that in addition to the the range area you're you're well on your way to having a having a good housing setup um, if you're going to put your hens in a daily move like some people are using the larger prairie schooners or mobile range coops you know the 20 by 40 ish type setup you know you can kind of factor on starting it somewhere maybe like a three square foot per bird if you're dealing with the the hybrid so these are a lot of numbers and um you know going through them kind of quickly but just kind of jot them down these are these are pretty reflexive numbers for for most of us in in the apple community and like i said some people will push these a little bit but turkeys you know again having enough space for them to roost inside their their range shelter um if you're going to move them daily you know and and house them over winter you know it's kind of like a four pounds or, or four square foot per per bird is a is a good starting point Some general things to consider, you know, I just delivered um, 500 ready to lay pullets to somebody and he put them into the flock with, with 500 other birds from some other source. And I just got a call, you know, within, within the last week or so that said, I got some, I got some mortality in my other flock that I put your birds in with. And I wanted to know, is it possible? And he asked about a disease because his his one flock was vaccinated with some stuff and or, or not vaccinated and the flock that I gave him was vaccinated. So he was wondering if they could carry the, the disease. And, you know, other than helping kind of troubleshoot some of those problems, my first thought was, oh my goodness, you just commingled two disparate flocks. And if there's a problem, not only are you going to take out the 500 birds, but you're going to take out a thousand so you know simple simple things like quarantining your birds um and separating and making sure there there's no uh, disease issues with them is, is always a recommended thing and flock rotation especially with your broilers i'm sorry especially with your layers all in all out flock rotation helps keep things healthy and happy um will kind of scoot through here for some of these you know fresh water that should be obvious um, nobody likes to drink dirty water or water with bedding in it or manure or whatever else we manage to find in our waterers um, raising birds with full beaks you know so this is one of those things you're like what does that have to do with anything but <clears throat> really the reason birds and this is we find this with the ready to lay pullets that we often source from the from contract growers is they trim the beaks and industry of course de-beaks birds when they put them in their cages but trimming and de-beaking the the birds is really a symptom of a of the management style and cramping those birds into a space where they are too stressed to live so they peck each other and you trim their beak or de-beak them so that you know when they peck their neighbor it doesn't hurt anybody um, so having an untrimmed beak is really a symbol of raising a bird to the best of their management or to the best of their natural tendencies and it it's a it, you know it's it's a it's a marker of of doing things in a in a more holistic way um so this idea of all in all out all this stuff talks about <clears throat> the disease where and of course the biggest disease risk we have here of late is highly highly pathogenic avian influenza the bird flu um you know you can there's there's two articles referenced there on the apple website if you're interested and you haven't seen them i recommend you take a look at them check them out but generally what we've known and what the most recent 
years have shown us is bird flu is primarily affecting the intensely confined birds where the viral load inside those houses is so great, there's no chance for any of the birds even coping with them. So once the virus gets into those barns, which it, you know, when you're dealing with biosecurity that relies on human following things and trying to keep things out from the wind, for example, it's very difficult. So they're going to get into the barns. There's going to be contamination inside those barns. And once they do, those, those environments are, are great environments for spreading HPAI. And you know that's just the numbers talking. You can look at the numbers. They don't lie. We have observable fact to, to back that up. It favors those intensely confined uh, poultry houses more than anything else. Feeding and watering. What I want to focus on here, um, you, know, you can read the bullet points. Always feed a nutritionally balanced ration. Every poultry you have deserves grit. That's hard, insoluble granite, um, which you know one of the the su big suppliers is granite grit, which supplies half of the country. Uh, if you need a if you need a grit source, contact me. But everybody has a size give it to them. Um, grit is different than oyster shell. Oyster shell is a calcium supplement you give to your layers to help them restore the calcium deposits in their bones. And it's, that's soluble. So that goes into the digestive system and that, and the bird absorbs it slowly over time. Grit goes into the gizzard and helps mash up the food and improve feed conversion and nutrient availability. Um, all your birds should be able to eat at the same time. That's reduces feed competition. Um, <clears throat> when you trouble, so we think this of uh, the idea of troubleshooting, you keep some records. So the best way to, to understand what your birds are doing is to know what they have done so that you have some ideas of what is normal or what is usual. Take pictures and always, 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 if you have a dead bird, open it up. If you don't know what you're looking for, you know, the Apple community is great for that. Somebody can help you do that, but, and your pictures can help you um, get some help that you need and always make time to observe. Slaughter practices, you know, one of the things that always drove me crazy when I was dry processing birds is people didn't withdraw their feed. You know, minimum 12 hours, 16 is probably more like it. Um, but you want all that, all that, that digestive stuff to go through their intestines and clear the bird. Because when you're processing birds, the last thing you want is a bunch of poop oozing out all over your evisceration table. If you're doing that, everything you've done to that point is for naught because your biggest source of contamination is the manure. So getting it all out of the, the bird when they're still living is critical. Um, create the birds at night under darkness. You'll save yourself a whole lot of heartache by doing that. And humane slaughter, you know, we won't go into much of that, that we can talk a little bit about that if you have questions and leverage your exemptions. You know, these are the processing exemptions, the, you know, a thousand bird, 20,000 bird producer grower type of, uh, exemptions that allow you to process birds on farm and sell them. It's a federal regulation. Some states make it incredibly difficult. Um, other states, you know, enable the process. So de unfortunately, it depends on where you live, but it's a great way to get into, get birds into the market. And I'll just pause here, let you kind of take this in. You'll have this for the, for reference. Apple cider vinegar though, is one of my go-to defenses for anything. So you can see the dosage there. If I'm going to use it as preventative, I want to prevent, say, heat stress when it's 85 or 90 degrees outside. I add a little bit of apple cider vinegar to my water. If I start running into problems where I see maybe I had some ascites and I, I see it, I want to add apple cider vinegar, two ounces to a gallon for a couple of days and, and, treat that way. So it's whenever I notice problems, apple cider vinegar is my go-to. And um, then we figure out what else needs to happen from there.
Okay, so I'm almost down to my last slide here. Um, want to talk just a moment on marketing, and then we'll take some questions. So, one of the things that it's hard to, if you're if you're not, haven't been marketing direct marketing poultry and eggs in the past, it's hard to understand or wrap our heads around the fact that we don't sell chicken, right? You know, some people will say that we sell solutions, you know, um, solutions to hunger, whatever the, ha whatever it happens to be, you know, it might be a busy mom and you have the, a, a solution to a dinner that's quick, easy, and nutritious. It, it might be chicken or turkey or eggs that are raised in a specific way to meet a customer's demands, but really you're selling, you're selling a solution. You're selling, um, your story in a lot of places. You know, I know lots of people who say that they have customers simply because of who they are. Not that there's somebody important or famous, but they're relatable. They have a story or they they connect with their their customers. So when you start thinking about raising birds, raising birds ultimately becomes the easy part. Um, you can improve the how you raise and produce the chickens and get better at it over time. But we understand how to raise birds very, very well. And with a couple of years, you will too. It's it's the marketing part that it becomes a little bit tougher for people. So figuring out who your customer is going to be and then developing all your marketing around that customer. So one example I always like to, to put in here because it's easy is if if you're targeting you know, Weston A price chapter members, they're going to be members who a lot of times seek out things like no soy fed birds. So if that's your, if that's your buyer, then you market the fact that you don't feed soy. That's important. If you're the kind of person that likes soy and you like to use roasted soy and put it in your, your cereal in the morning, then, you know, you're not going to sell to the person who doesn't want soy. So you understand it's okay to not sell to everybody. You can't sell to everybody. You just need to figure out who that person is, understand them and build lists of those people and then stay in touch with them. That's the short version of, uh, what, of email marketing, you might call it. But it really, any kind of marketing, whether it's podcasts or at the market or your brochures or your website is all going to talk to this one person, this ideal person who's buying your stuff. Um, some simple acknowledgements, you know, I spent a lot of time with a lot of great people in my local community. People like Jeff Maddox and Eli Reif are, have been instrumental to my, what I know about poultry and the APA community has been, you know, undeniably one of the most critical parts of of what where i've been able to to start and and come um without that i probably don't know half the things i do um so here we go we'll we'll wrap it up there leave a few minutes for questions and no i <clears throat> thanks thanks mike this is larissa again um i appreciate that you're quite thorough and insightful presentation. And um, so I think we're ready to take your questions. And I think a lot of you have already found the, the question area. Um, there's a green question mark at the top of your screen where you can submit a question and I'm going to read them aloud and then Mike will respond. So I know a couple of them already came in um, during the presentation. So be scroll down there. Um, so we have a question about, do you suggest for protection in winter when electric fence, or what do you suggest for protection in winter when electric fencing is no longer workable? A permanent fence is not a solution in her case. Yeah, so um, assuming, I always would assume and recommend that the birds come into like the barnyard environment. So maybe that's a high tunnel or a hoop house or you have a, a permanent barn where the birds can be deep bedded with, with lots of space and fresh bedding. Um, but if you are going to keep them out on pasture, you know, that's a little bit tougher. I don't, I, I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you get snow, you got a truck out there to pretend the, the birds in the snow, always bring, bring them in closer and then you can 
always put up a sacrifice lot with some temporary fencing if you need. Okay, next question. Um, does APA have any recommendations or plans for pastured poultry shelters? Um, so that's a good question. There's a few uh, designs posted on the resources section. Um, actually, I just changed the website. So I think it's the resources section. Let me go look real quick. There's a there's a few few housing designs out there. Um, yeah, under resources. So you know they they range from the hoop house to the the salatin, and people are building their own much larger structures these days. So the, it's it's a frequent conversation topic. Um, uh, uh, there's also a request, Mike, that you please talk a little bit about having enough ventilation, but not having drafts. Oh yeah, the shelters, uh, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> the brooder. Yep. Yep. And so that, yeah, basically it's a kind of the way to think about it is drafts are going to be what would affect the birds at, at their level. So a draft would blow directly onto the birds. Um, and if you, in your brooder, you might see that you have a draft. If all of your birds are pushed against one wall, for example, that might indicate a draft, but ventilation is coming in over top of the birds and circulates up top. Um, thanks, Mike. We have had a couple questions about looking at the slides again. Um, and I just want to assure everyone that the slides will be available for you tomorrow. I'm going to email out both the, the audio visual presentation as a whole, and then the PowerPoint. So you can have those notes, um, um, at your fingertips, but uh, we'll keep going with the questions. Um, okay, next question is, is there a hybrid hybrid bird that works well for laying and meat? Yeah, so you are you start looking at the heritage type birds, you know, like a, maybe an ostrilorp or a barred rock would, would be those kind of, those kind of birds. And when you get into the heritage birds, really, you know, one way to think about it is they're all dual purpose because you got to eat the roosters because mm -hmm. you're going to get, you know, half as many roosters as you will, um, pullets. So things like that, you know, the, the Delawares people have used for, for both, um, Buckeyes being primarily a, a meat producing bird, but you're, you're looking at those kinds of birds. All right. So, uh, suggestions for um, major heat. This is for, um, from someone out of um, San Antonio, South Texas. I'm sorry, what was that question? They're, they're, uh, they're looking for suggestions um, during times of um, extreme heat. Uh, Some of them, yeah. So a couple of ways you can deal with that heat. One is you don't raise the, assuming we're talking meat birds here, you don't raise the meat birds in your hottest time of year is one option not always practical um two you choose a, a bird that is well suited like there's some of the the slower growing broilers like um Sasso naked neck or freedom ranger for example or even the heritage breeds will will do better in the heat um and then some of our larger producers like cob creek and windy meadows family farm down there in texas they actually are actually i don't know about winnie meadows but cob creek runs misters inside of their their range coops so they miss their birds in the hot weather so a couple of different options uh next question is about continuous grazing and so the question is so continuous grazing is bad even if there are only five birds on a 50 foot by 50 foot pasture can you explain why that would be bad <clears throat> so if you have everybody in a in a in that section you know five birds you you're probably gonna you're probably gonna get away with it um give it enough time though birds will always develop their favorite spots to go so they're always gonna wear specific areas down and given enough time they will they will ultimately turn grass into dirt um but if you have if you're large enough and you only have a couple birds, you, you may, you may forgo that, but generally the trend is birds in the same area eventually turn grass to dirt. 
Uh, Mike, do you have uh, any pasture rotation solutions for large turkey flocks in, um, specifically? Um, I'm not sure what the what the question is, but I'll, I'll take a stab. So one of the, the ways that I found that work really well for my turkeys, um, at least my broad breasted when I raise them, because they're they're really easy to herd, is I like to run two parallel fences, and then with with cross shorter cross fences for my and I'm using electric netting here, so portable fencing, and then when it comes time to move my birds, I pull the front fence up, drag the house forward to the new area, and then herd the, the turkeys into the area, put the fence in behind them, and then I already have a, a fence out in front of them. So I'm moving two cross fences down the length of my parallel fence. Works pretty well for me. That way I'm not, um, I'm not trying to fight electric fencing after dark and my turkey's running all over the woods in my case. Um, never a fun time. And Mike, could you repeat the name of the grit producer that you use? So it's Granny Grit out of North Carolina. It's G-R-A-N-I Grit. Um, a lot of times the folks out of, out of the Midwest will use a cherry stone or a, a cherry grit producer. It's just, I'm not sure who it's distributed by. It's not quite as hard and it's also red. Um, but those are the two primary options, but it's a hard grit and they don't, the thing about grit that I didn't mention in the presentation is your birds almost never are going to find, I mean, and I could say never, but you know, there's always maybe an exception out there, one in a thousand, but your, your birds aren't going to find the grit that they need for their life stage on the pasture. You know, if you go out and look at the, the pasture and you say, well, they'll just get the grit, go ahead and look in their pasture and see how much grit those birds actually have. Um, they, they really do need it. It really does help their, their digestion and it translates into, to more, you know, more eggs and more meat. Excellent. So we have time for just a, a couple more questions um, before we close. Um, so with the next question is, with an egg mobile setup, can you please describe the predation, predation setup control? So um, when I did a, a small egg mobile, I used my, my two things were electric fencing that was charged, it was hot, and then geese. Um, so mm -hmm. fencing is a part of it. I think usually in every situation, whether it's a wider perimeter or whether it's a more a, a smaller paddock, but then some kind of guard animal like a like a livestock guardian dog or geese in my case. Um, next question, Mike. At what age do you process your heritage breeds? So some of them vary. Um, you know, I know there's a producer out in California who raises Delawares and she was getting uh, four, four and a half pound birds, I believe, in 14 weeks, which was pretty good. You know, that bird's capable in its heyday of 12 weeks to market. Um, a lot of times New Hampshire's are going to be in that 16 to 18 weeks. And most most of those heritage chickens will fall in that range. Uh, turkeys are going to probably be in the 28 26, 28 week range, um, which is a lot of time. And then right now, um, how do you handle mites? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I never actually had to handle any. Um, so you know, giving them a, a, giving them a dust bath and, and trying to let them do it naturally. If you, if, if they're, if you're having some mite problems, I would, I would, you know, if you have access to like wood, wood ashes might be one thing, but you'd also build something with, uh, some peat moss and some diatomaceous earth. Just give them a chance to get in there and, and naturally work around that dust bathing. That's a natural tendency for them. They'll, they'll want to dust bathe and that's, 
they're doing it to, to keep clean as odd as it may sound. So if you have that first step I would do is give them a dust bath. Excellent. Okay. So, um, Thank you so much, Mike. I just have a few housekeeping items before we sign off. Uh, as I mentioned, a recording of this webinar will be available. Um, it will be archived on the FACT website, and I'm also going to email it out to you all, along with any links and um, copies of the slides. Um, also, immediately after the webinar ends, you'll be asked to complete a very short survey about your experience. And if you had a question that we didn't get to or you, you thought of after we ended the, the Q&A, you can type it in there and give us any other feedback um, on that survey. So a quick plug about our upcoming webinars. We, uh, we have one next week. Please join us on next Wednesday for an info session. I'm going to be hosting about Fax Fund of Farmer Grants. And then the following week on November 8th, we have an expert organic grass milk producer who's going to be talking about how to go 100% grass fed with your dairy herd. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, FACT is currently accepting applications for our Fund of Farmer Grants. They're due December 4th, so you still have quite a few weeks to apply. Uh, we have two types of grants this year, one for projects that would increase access to well-managed pasture for your animals, and a second uh, for projects that would help farmers attain um, one of uh, several certifications. So check out our webpage, attend the, the info session next week, and um, apply online. So again, a sincere, sincere thank you to Mike for your really excellent presentation and for taking the time to answer you know, so many of our questions. Uh, and I also like to thank all the uh, members of our audience for your attention and interest. It was certainly been my pleasure to host this webinar. Um, so I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening and that we connect again soon. So thanks thank again. You. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Larissa. Yes. Talk to you soon. Bye.